everyone. In today's video, I'm going to be going over a case study, a real patient from my office with Hashimoto's who has the following problems. She has daily headaches, fatigue all day long, depression, and body aches. So uh, let's get into it. So again, real patient from my office, she has Hashimoto's, and I like to start with looking at the patient's history. So here we go. So as a child, she had a lot of trauma, both psychological, some physical, some sexual abuse. Why do we even care about that? Because trauma and abuse like that, certainly that isn't processed and treated professionally, can be uh, inflammatory, believe it or not. Uh, stress, and this is certainly a stress, is very inflammatory. And if this is something that hasn't been dealt with professionally, then I'm immediately interested <laughs> in maybe referring this person out to get that help because uh, it's a very big deal. So I'm not a therapist. I don't try to do therapy, but I like to recognize when there's something here that could be treated by someone other than me. Uh, second thing is she took a lot of different antibiotics as a child. Now, why does that matter? Because if you take a lot of antibiotics, that means you may have had a lot of different infections. And I have different videos on this, but a lot of different infections mean you are predisposed and have a higher risk to develop cross-reaction. And infections can trigger a lot of different uh, problems, including autoimmune conditions. Now, also, the kind of the GI side of things, when you have a lot of antibiotic treatment, is it can impair your GI uh, gut integrity and a leaky gut or a hyperleaky gut is inflammatory can also lead to autoimmune problems. Now, in 1992, she had mono. We care about this because mono, Epstein Barr, is a known uh, trigger for multiple sclerosis. And, you know, like 80% of us have been exposed to Epstein Barr. But if you've been exposed to it and we have other histories of infections, that's kind of getting my mind working in a, in a certain way. In 1994, uh, she had sinus surgery. A few years after that, she finally quit drinking milk and she had complete resolution of the sinus problems. I've seen that a, a hundred thousand times. Uh, in 2012, someone said, hey, you might have Hashimoto's. Now, I don't have the uh, testing. She couldn't remember if she was tested or not. At that time, she was having chronic fatigue and depression and perhaps she had some sort of abnormality in her thyroid uh, panel. And that's why they said, hey, you might have Hashimoto's. Now, a year later, she was treated for SIBO, and that stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And, you know, that's a real hot uh, kind of topic in the uh, functional medicine world in the last couple of years. In my experience, most SIBO testing results are pretty borderline. I just presumptively treat people for SIBO if I think they have it. Uh, a couple of years after that, uh, she had fibromyalgia symptoms. What does that mean, though, right? That means you have chronic widespread pain, you've got a sleep problem, you know, a lot of people could be uh, diagnosed with that. Uh, pharmacology is not really like a, you know, it's like not an endpoint diagnosis, just describing what's happening, right? It doesn't really tell you why it's happening. Uh, she also had depression, chronic fatigue, and some fading eyesight. And then in 2015, she may have had mono again. So again, we had a lot of infections. We had mono, mono again. She had a root canal. I won't talk about that at the moment. But also, all this is happening the same year, right? 2015. She had unexplained hydrocephalus that eventually resolved. Now, she had to have, had to have a, a hole drilled in her skull to relieve that. Hydrocephalus is when you get uh, inappropriately or an excessive retention of fluid in the brain. And I've had some people over the years uh, with that. There's a condition called pseudotumor cerebri, which is basically increased intracranial pressure. And bottom line is most of those people that I've seen with that have either had an inflammatory event cause it or they responded well to an anti-inflammatory treatment. 2020, she had COVID. She thinks she had it again in 2022. Now, why do we care about that? Well, because COVID really messes with your immune system. I've got several different videos on this, but it loves to stimulate autoimmune problems of various kinds. Now, in women, it loves to stimulate Hashimoto's. So whether you had a genetic predisposition or not, COVID likes to do that. Now, it's linked to a lot of different other autoimmune problems as well. Uh, but we know that, you know, the symptoms of COVID can stick with you for a long time. We call it long COVID or post-acute sequelae of COVID. So I'm really becoming interested in whether or not this person has an ongoing inflammatory problem over the years and maybe even made worse since she had COVID. She had hemorrhoids, which is not really, uh, I can explain what that means, but it's not really relevant to today. And again, this year, 2023, Hashimoto's was again advanced as a diagnosis. Now, I don't have lab testing to look at. I don't know if she wasn't really a good historian about that, but she was recommended to take, to take levothyroxine. However, when she took it, she felt overmedicated and hyperthyroid and she had palpitation, so she stopped taking it. So my guess is, um, if we had those labs, is that she probably wasn't overtly hypothyroid. She was probably euthyroid. She had the antibodies, 
And all you have to have is the antibodies to make you feel bad because remember Hashimoto's is an inflammatory condition and it loves to create problems in lots of other systems. It's like having an octopus sitting on your back with 500 arms, right? It loves to get its tentacles in all different corners of your biochemistry in your body, even if you're euthyroid. But the spectrum of Hashimoto's goes euthyroid, subclinical, and that's when your TSH is a little high, but the T4 isn't low. And then you have overt, where the TSH is high and the T4 is low. Um, someone probably re recommended her to take medication when she really didn't need it, uh, which is why she had the palpitations. It felt like she was over-medicated. Now, she is taking, and I bring this up because invariably someone is taking something, it seems like, that they shouldn't be taking. They just didn't know it, right? She's taking melatonin, lemon balm, which is a TH1 cytokine booster, magnesium citrate, not a problem, selenium, not a problem, Some, a, a thyroid formula, I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, but it's got a couple things in it I'm not a fan of. Uh, something called astroisatis, which is really a, like echinacea. It's, it's an immune system booster, TH1 cytokine booster. And the thing is, we don't know if she can take that or not. We don't know what her immunophenotype is. We don't know what her fingerprint is. Maybe she can take it. Maybe she can't take it. We're going to do the test and find out. But there's a good chance, I'm just going to tell you just from my experience over 20 years, she's probably taken something she shouldn't. Uh, she also takes Excedrin every day. Uh, which tells you how bad her headaches are. She's got to take Excedrin every single day. Now, she is taking care of an older child uh, who has a TBI, so she's stressed a lot. Stress is inflammatory. Uh, she's also still trying to work 40 hours a week, but she's got to take Excedrin every day because the headaches are so bad. All right, so again, she presents to me kind of a review. She's got Hashimoto's, but again, Hashimoto's is not the end point. Hashimoto's tells me she's got an autoimmune problem probably, uh, and there's a lot of other things we need to look at, but that's not the end point. Okay, so she's got headaches. She's got daily headaches, pressure behind the eyes in the suboccipital area. She has fatigue all day long, which honestly, if someone has fatigue all day long, it doesn't get worse certain time of day. That kind of rules out your HPA stuff. Doesn't really rule out uh, iron or these other things that it could be. Uh, she also has depression and uh, she has body aches. Now, depression and fatigue that can happen if you have neuroinflammation. You've got inflammation inside your central nervous system. Sometimes fatigue is not because you have an iron problem or a B12 problem or a thyroid problem. It's because you have inflammation inside your central nervous system and it tends to slow brain function down. And when that happens, you tend to perceive fatigue, but remains to be seen, okay? Now, here's some pre-treatment labs. Uh, there's other things I could show you, but I'm just gonna point out a couple things I thought were really important. So, her vitamin D is an 81. That's actually really good for someone with an autoimmune problem. Most people uh, with an autoimmune problem, they don't take vitamin D. Their vitamin D is terrible. That's kind of sort of the, uh, kind of the genetic package you get with that. Now, what I do not like at all is the fact that her fibrinogen level is 832. That's almost double the reference range. That is bad. Why is that bad? Because fibrinogen, when it's that high, really predisposes you to clotting. Does that sound like a good idea? No, it sounds like a terrible thing, right? Predisposes you to clots. You could get a clot in your heart. You get a clot in your lung. You could throw a clot uh, into your brain. So this is really concerning to me. Now, what's doubly concerning is her CRP, which is a C-reactive protein. That is kind of a, a general inflammation marker. Hers is seven times the reference range. So remember I said I thought she might be inflamed? Well, yeah, she's definitely inflamed. Even though her vitamin D looks great, she's still got some real inflammatory problems here that are a very bad kind of explosive combination, right? Inflammation plus clotting risk is not good. All right, the other thing that we did uh, is that we did this multiple tissue autoimmune reactivity panel. Now, I don't do this on everybody, but I did it on her because we did want to find out, hey, do you really have Hashimoto's? what other autoimmune things might be going on, right? Because I thought she had COVID, I mean, she had COVID and these other things. Um, this is not every antibody that a person could have, but it's a pretty good net that you can cast. And again, I don't have any kind of financial interest in any of these labs. They don't pay me. I don't get like discounts or anything. It's just what I think are the best tests. So she had ASCA and ANCA antibodies. Now what those are, anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies and anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. You find these in things like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and irritable bowel syndrome. And she didn't really have a lot of that, but she did have some GI symptoms that weren't her chief complaints. So this, this may have some relevance. Uh, her cytochrome P450 hepatocyte antibodies were elevated because uh, cytochrome P450 and the hepatocytes, uh, those can elevate, and I think I have a video coming up on this pretty soon, if you eat gluten. Uh, gluten reactivity or gluten sensitivity, gluten antibodies cross-react with liver antibodies, uh, with yeah, with liver, 
and they can elevate your AST and ALT. Now her AST and ALT on the blood work were normal. I didn't even show it to you, but we know that her immune system is targeting some things and this is not good. And these antibodies have predictive power. Another video will be coming up with soon. What I mean by that is tissue antibodies can be elevated for years before you get the overt disease associated with it. And if you don't do anything about it, there's a good chance that that's what's actually gonna happen. So we'll find out. Now the last bit that we did on that panel was her thyroglobulin antibodies, which are very elevated for this scale. So yeah, she's got Hashimoto's, but her TSH and her T4 were normal in the labs that we did. So she has euthyroid Hashimoto's, which means she probably doesn't need medication, but she can still feel bad anyway. It's very important uh, to make sure that whoever you're working with understands that. Now we did this uh, lymphocyte map, which is kind of that immune system fingerprint. And just basically what we see here is that her lymphocytes are up, her immune system is activated, makes sense. And then we start looking at these different sort of little teeter-totters, right? And her T-cell, B-cell teeter-totter is off because her percent B-cells are a little bit up, which throws that T-cell, B-cell ratio off. And that's a little incongruent with the next name, but nonetheless, her T-helper-1, T-helper-2 teeter-totter is off. Her T-helper-1s uh, are up. So she is what we would call T-helper-1 dominant. That's why you see that ratio look like that. Now, it's dominant because her TH1 is too high. Now, remember a minute ago, we talked about the isotis and the lemon balm. She shouldn't be taking those because that's going to make her further imbalanced, right? All right. Um, we do this so that we know what do we need to treat her because you treat this scenario differently therapeutically than you would if it didn't look like this. And that's why everyone's got their own phenotype, even if they've got the diagnosis of Hashimoto's like a thousand other people. They have their own phenotype. Now, we also did... Uh, a little stool test to try to look a little bit further into her GI stuff. And the thing I'll show you here is this guy here. They see this plus four potential pathogen. Then that's what PP means. That's a four plus growth on this stuff called Klebsiella pneumoniae, which should not be in her GI tract. All this other NP stuff is non-pathogen. We're not going to worry about that. But a four plus potential pathogen, that is, in my experience, something that we need to treat. And so we're going to treat that. Now, Here's where the, uh, you know, kind of the magic comes in, so to speak. And I know everyone always gets, I shouldn't, maybe they don't, but some people I know get mad at me because they want me to explain exactly what the treatment was so that they can treat themselves. And I can't do that. It would be irresponsible of me to say, hey, here's exactly how I treated this lady. And knowing that a lot of you people at home are going to say, oh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take whatever he gave her. I'll do whatever diet he gave her because that's not how it works. I did this based on her phenotype and her results and her history, and it would not be smart of you to try to re replicate that. Uh, that's kind of my problem with a lot of uh, like books and courses you can buy on this stuff that are marketed to the public because it's all really, really generic, and you really need to be specific, right? So I can't give you the treatment, but I'm showing you this so that you can see what's possible if you work with someone who has the right training and the right experience. So here's her response after 60 days of treatment. What did her labs do? Okay, now remember, uh, the vitamin D was an 81, that was pretty good, but her fibrinogen was really high and her CRP was really high. So after 60 days of doing the treatment plan that I designed for her, here's what we got. So the fibrinogen, fibrinogen that's 441, that's normal now. If you do the math on that, that's gone down by 53%. That is great. Now it's still on the high end. I would like it to be lower, but at least it's not, you know, two times what the reference range is. So we're really happy about that, right? Now the other thing we're really happy about, if you look at her CRP, it's 0 0.8. That's now normal, right? It used to be a 7. That's gone down by 99%. So objectively, do we have a decrease in inflammatory markers? Absolutely. Have we most likely really, uh, practically speaking, decreased the danger of her having a clotting issue? Absolutely. But now, we got to see how she feels because if she doesn't feel any different, we have a problem, right? Now, these are important. Don't get me wrong, but she came to me because she felt bad, right? And so we got to really make sure that we're doing something that changes how she feels. So she's really the test. So let's see what she says. So the daily headaches are reduced by almost 100%. She's only now having occasional pressure. She's no longer taking Excedrin, which is awesome, right? I mean, her liver is thanking her for not taking Excedrin. So we know we're making a difference, right? She goes through years of headaches, and now she's 60 days into treatment. She's having mild pressure occasionally. That's awesome. The fatigue is improved by 
okay? The body aches and depression have improved by 50%. And so I still think that what her problem was, she was really, really inflamed. And all the side effects of the cytokines that they can have on your mitochondria, on, on your brain, that's what I think was really driving all that. And we're not even done. I want to see her improve even more, and then I want to see her stable that way, right? And then eventually we're going to start pulling things away that we're giving her as far as treatment to see if she still, still really, need, uh, really needs it or not. So I give you this video and I give you this case study, number one, because I think it's important for you to see uh, maybe you see you in here, or you see a loved one in here, and they can get help. There are things you can do to get better and stay better, but here's the thing. You got to work with a doctor who is going to be a detective and knows how to analyze the history, knows what tests to order based on that person's case, how to interpret those tests correctly, and how to design a treatment plan based on those tests, and then how to find out and have kind of a, how do we know if you're getting better? What do we do if you don't get better? So, those people exist. You've got to find one. Make sure you're working with someone that understands all the stuff we talked about today. Because if they do, there's a good chance they're going to help you get better. So remember, you don't have to suffer. Uh, if you guys like these kind of case studies, you know, like the video, comment, you know, kind of tell me. Because I got a lot of these I could do. Uh, and I, had, I hope you guys found this helpful today. Okay, I'll see you next time.